This is the Chicago Tribune Tower. It was designed to be the most beautiful office building in the world. But today it's called the Tribune Tower Residences after its 34 floors of office space were converted to 162 residential condominiums just this year. While the numbers of this are staggering, the economics of this kind of transition from office to luxury residential must have made sense here. The building sold for $240 million and took another $150 million for the conversion. Office spaces across the US and even the world are sitting vacant from the changing nature of work coming off of the COVID pandemic. Vacancy rates are as high as 20% nationwide. While the Tribune Tower didn't sit vacant for very long, and its economic turn was driven by the changing media landscape, it does preview what seems to be inevitable. Empty offices are decimating the commercial real estate industry. It's predicted to plunge at a total of 39%, or $454 billion in the coming years, according to a recent study by business professors at Columbia and NYU. And this problem isn't just a challenge for individual building owners entire downtown districts are suffering too. The loop seems like a shadow of itself. Empty offices means fewer people in the streets. Then this hits retail, with many longtime tenants closing up shop and on and on. The emptying structures are oftentimes premium, well-maintained building that are in the prime of their material lifespans, their physical viability, and in great locations. If office workers aren't coming back anytime soon, repurposing these buildings as places to live makes a ton of sense. That isn't always that easy though, or even physically possible sometimes, even if the economics work out fine. The New York Times recently ran an incredible piece about the challenges that are associated with these types of conversions. There are a host of laws that protect folks from residential structures and layouts that could pose health or safety risks to those that live there. Many of these laws came about to rectify the deplorable conditions of tenement housing and ensure access to light air, and escape routes for fire for all residences. But these are not the same requirements that office towers abide by. So older towers like the Tribune Tower with relatively small floor plates and with windows that open to let in fresh air make the conversion relatively straightforward and easy. But large office buildings with large floor plates and inoperable windows like, say, the Willis Tower just cannot be converted. And while I am concerned for my adopted hometown of Chicago, and the pangs of empty offices can be felt immediately and strongly in dense urban areas like this. In some ways, this is the kind of place that is most equipped to weather this storm. I mean, converting buildings like the Tribune Tower to residential made financial sense even before the pandemic. And I'm also concerned, and maybe even more concerned, for places where there is much less economic incentive to be able to repurpose empty office buildings, like in much of the Midwestern United States. Wharton real estate professor Joseph Giorco warns us to think about the Rust Belt. It may not be viable to convert anything from office to residential, and this could lead to a real downward spiral in weak office markets that don't have much natural growth to them. For many suburban locations and office parks, this might be a welcome change. Like the dead malls before it, the generic low-grade architecture and poor urbanism coming from single-use zoning and car-centric infrastructure, it won't be very missed. But the benefits of office jobs for those that live there will certainly hurt. But maybe they can shift to remote positions. But then there's just the question of what will happen to all these structures. Will they be bulldozed, left to rot, or will they be converted to mixed use or residential if, if viable or possible? I want to make sure that we choose wisely. And I want to make sure that the economics and immediate returns on investment aren't the only factors that we consider here. Fox recently made a video about spending a day working in the greatest office building in the world. That's the title that they gave to the SC Johnson Wax headquarters, which is about 60 miles north of me here in Chicago, in Racine, Wisconsin. The conclusion that Vox came to was that the nature of work was indeed changed, and that amazing architectural explorations like Frank Lloyd Wright's iconic mushroom columns are just a fancy Zoom backdrop, if they're not accommodated with the energy and the camaraderie that other people bring to you while you're working around them. As someone that loves architecture for more than its ability to just provide virtual backgrounds, I made the pilgrimage myself to check out if it was true. And what I found was pretty strange. The Frank Lloyd Wright buildings are empty. The iconic research tower, where products such as RAID and OFF were invented, hasn't been a viable laboratory since the 1980s. And to my surprise, that admin building with all those offices, awesome desks, and mushroom columns was only emptied out last year. 
While you know the building leaked the day that it opened, the space is absolutely spectacular. It brought notoriety to the company, along with cementing the company's image as a sophisticated patron of architecture. They brought grand cultural production to a small Wisconsin town, which wouldn't have been able to afford it otherwise. Everyone who worked in that building was moved to a new one across the parking lot. And that one's decidedly less iconic, though it's still wrought with spectacle. And it was designed by the firm Gensler about two years ago. SC Johnson Wax is working like a museum caretaker of these defunct cathedrals of work. But of course they aren't a museum. The campus is still a working corporate campus. And this is wrought with contradictions, as evidenced by the tracking necklaces that they make you wear as glimpsed in Vox's video. But the conundrum remains, corporations own some pretty amazing office structures that deserve preservation because of their contribution to culture as a whole. But these buildings have transcended the status of mere real estate or marketing assets. So what do you do? If you've watched the show Severance, its exterior scenes are filmed at a place called Bell Works. In reality, it's much more than an office building. It's a highly successful mixed-use development with some office, but also retail, entertainment, hotel, residential, and healthcare facilities. It was one of Interior Design's Best of the Year Award winners in 2022, and it's a complete commercial success, even if from the outside, it serves as a symbol of faceless corporations on TV. But it didn't start life as this real-world city-like hub in the middle of New Jersey. It began as a suburban office complex designed by Aero Saarinen, the same architect as the St. Louis Arch and that beautiful TWA terminal. Its road between now and then has been a rocky one. The original design was divided into four pavilions of labs and offices, each separated by the others with a cross-shaped atrium. The internal pavilions are linked via sky bridges and a perimeter walkway. It received the Laboratory of the Year Award in 1967. But by 2007, Bell moved out and the building sat empty. The company maintained the structures and trimmed its landscape, but time was hard on it and demolition and redevelopment seemed inevitable. It was listed as one of the most endangered historic sites in all of New Jersey. But former employees of Bell gathered together and created a citizens group that they called Preserving Holmdel, the name of the campus. They lobbied for the buildings to be placed on the National Register of Historic Places, and they also worked with developers to help reimagine how the buildings might be repurposed instead of bulldozed. After six years of sitting empty, the buildings and the site were purchased for only $27 million, and the successful redevelopment began, and then the rest is history. But it required dedicated folks who loved those buildings to be able to make it happen. And while this sounds like a unique and local case, it's not as distant as you might think. Right on the route between me and that SC Johnson campus is a suburb called Deerfield, which currently has a 101-acre corporate campus for sale. It was owned by another laboratory, Baxter International. And the campus was designed by the same firm and team at Skidmore, Owings & Merrill that designed the Hancock Tower here in Chicago. To justify its sale, Baxter says, to best meet the evolving needs of our employees, Baxter is reviewing options related to our current headquarters, which was designed and built in the 1970s, and will pursue options for new modern and more sustainable headquarters. But this is not just a generic office park either. It was extremely well regarded as a piece of architecture. There's no question about that. But because of where it was, it wasn't something that became part of a, a Chicago narrative. I mean, it, it's, it was in Deerfield, you know. So. One of its structures is a very significant space with a suspended roof plane that hovers like a bridge. It's hung from two large masts with cables. This roof is absolutely massive. It's about the size of a football field, all just kind of dangling in the air. This feat would have been impossible if it wasn't for a clever invention. It would have been very unstable if left to just what you could see from the outside. The roof would swing around and sway way too much. So what they did was they pulled down the roof with another set of cables on the inside. And this seems counterintuitive, like why would you pull down on something that's hanging? But it stabilizes a system, so it moves only about an inch in any direction, making the whole scheme viable to create a vast, unbroken space underneath a single roof plane. The only structure you see when you're in there are the two masts and the, and the roof uh, framing, but everything else is wide open. These kinds of cable structures were at the forefront of innovation at the time during the 70s, with folks like Fry Otto's experiments in Germany, like the Munich Olympic Complex. 
So I think that this example really represents a breakthrough that I think deserves preservation. This book, Case Studies in Retrofitting Suburbia, has a ton of great examples of office parks being turned into successful mixed-use developments. I hope that whoever ends up with the Baxter campus has a copy. So I guess I'm arguing that we need to assess the architectural value of our office buildings in addition to their economic and social values in times like these. Communities are going to need to fight for great architecture. Get them on historic registries, get creative with solutions that preserve and repurpose these structures. While Frank Lloyd Wright's innovative office building will likely preserve in perpetuity, even if it sits empty, Wright wasn't the only one innovating here. Architecture is more than a Zoom backdrop, Fox. It's our culture. While real estate is owned by corporations, architecture is more like art that belongs to all of us. Sure, you can make the argument that whoever owns it should be able to do whatever they want, but I think that's a little bit short-sighted, and it's up to us to recognize the value of our buildings and to fight for their repurposing when it makes sense. This video is supported by Nebula, which means that you can watch my next video right now. It's about Habitat 67 and the benefits of pixelized housing. I traveled all the way to Boston to interview the architect Moshe Safdie to be able to get his perspective on the subject. It was a total blast. Nebula is a little something that I've been working on with a lot of your other favorite creators. It's where I and channels like Johnny Harris, Not Just Bikes, and City Beautiful, and dozens more upload our regular YouTube videos early, and we share videos that we experiment with on topics and techniques that aren't strangled by the YouTube algorithm. There are thousands of these videos and they are all completely ad-free. Nebula also features exclusive originals and game shows like Jetlag. And now if you sign up with my link, you get access to Nebula Classes, where our creators host classes on how to be, well, a creator. All of these classes are taught by the folks here on Nebula, so you can learn how the Friday checkout makes a video, or how foreign tell stories, or how Patrick Willems makes movies. It's your favorite creators teaching you how they create great for aspiring creators or folks who just love seeing behind the curtain. So click on the link in the description, watch that next video, it's great. There's also an exclusive extended interview with Moshe Softy. Nebula costs $2.50 per month when you sign up for a year. You'll be unlocking access to the secret treasures of your favorite YouTube creators, and you'll be supporting me to be able to continue making content that explores the depths of the built environment. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. Let's engage in the discussion below with your thoughts on empty offices. Watch the extended cut over on Nebula and check out some of these other videos. See you over there.